Nehemiah chapter number 6. <clears throat> Starting in verse number 10. Nehemiah 6 verse number 10. Afterward I came unto the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, the son of Mehetabeel, who was shut up. And he said, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple. And let us shut the doors of the temple, for they will come to slay thee. Yea, in the night will they come to slay thee. And I said, should such a man as I flee? And who is there that, being as I am, would go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. And lo, I perceived that God had not sent him, but that he pronounced this prophecy against me, for Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. Therefore was he hired, that I should be afraid and do so and sin, that they might have matter for an evil report, that they might reproach me. My God, think, upon, think thou upon Tobiah and Sanballat, according to these their works, and on the prophetess Noadiah and the rest of the prophets, that would have put me in fear. So the wall was finished in the twenty and fifth day of the month Elul, in fifty and two days. And it came to pass that when all our enemies had heard thereof, and all the heathen that were about us saw these things, they were much cast down in their own eyes, for they perceived that this work was wrought of our God. Moreover, in those days the nobles of Judah sent many letters unto Tobiah, and the letters of Tobiah came unto them, for there were many in Judah sworn unto him, but because he was the son-in-law of Shechaniah, the son of Era, and his son Johanan had taken the daughter of Meshulam, the son of Berechiah. Also they reported his good deeds before me, and uttered my words to him. And Tobiah sent letters to put me in fear. Father, thank you once again for the privilege of opening up your book, preaching it to a congregation of uh, your dear children, dear saints of God. Please help us, Lord, as we open up your Bible, Lord, not to be unchanged by your words, not to be unchanged by the convicting power of the Holy Spirit, but to have a desire to line up with it, have a desire to grow, uh, draw closer to you. Thank you, Father, for, as we heard about, talked in the Sunday school hour, for going to that cross willingly by your own choice, Lord, not to gain anything for yourself, Lord, but that we might have eternal life. And we're so very thankful for that, Lord. We would be, we would be lost without hope, without God in this world, had you not done that for us. Thank you. Please help us this morning. And uh, give us the help and the encouragement that we need. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Chapter 6, verse number 10 um, says, Afterward, I came unto the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, the son of Mehetabeel, who was shut up. And he said, Let us meet together. Let us meet together in the house of God within the temple. And let us shut the doors of the temple. Now look back at verse number 2. Uh, verse 2 says, Then Sanballat and Geshem sent unto me, saying, Come. Let us meet together in some one of the villages in the plain of Ono, but they thought to do me mischief. So the enemies focused all their attacks against Nehemiah. Um, they've pretty much given up fighting against Jew the Jews as a whole. They've stopped fighting against all the builders, and now all their focus, all their direction is completely 100% against Nehemiah. Because if you can take out the leader, then you pretty much got a chance of, of taking out the whole plan and the whole work. And so, verse 2, the temptation was, meet together with us outside Jerusalem, outside the walls, in the, in the plain of Ono. And we were there, we said, and anyone says, anyone says, you should come to the plain of Ono, you just tell them, oh no, oh no, not going there. And um, the temptation was to leave the people of God, leave the work of God, and meet together with the world in the world. That was the temptation in verse number 2. In verse number 10, the temptation is to meet together, but this time it's not in the plain of Ono. This time it's not outside the city. This time it's inside the city. It says, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple and let us shut the doors of the temple. So the first temptation is meet outside Jerusalem. The second one is meet together inside Jerusalem. Jerusalem, but both violate the word of God. Both, both will get him to stop working. 
And that's the goal. The goal is to stop the work. If he leaves the work to go outside or if he leaves the work to hide in the temple, either way, he's not doing the work. And that's the goal, to, uh, to get the work to stop. And folks, these two temptations is how the world and how the devil and how the flesh is going to come after you. First of all, they will try to get you to leave the world. They, le- they will try to get you to join them in the world. They will try to get you to leave the church, leave the people of God, leave the people who are doing something for God, and get you to join the, war- join the world with them outside the walls. Uh, the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 4 that Demas, he forsook Paul. Why? Because he loved this present world. And that's what they're going to try to get you to do. They're going to try to get you to leave the people of God and join them in the world. But if they can't do that, if that's not successful, if they can't draw you out of church, if they can't draw you away from the work of God, then they will try to get you to hide in the house of God so that you have no contact with the world. See, they'll try to draw you to one extreme or another. They'll try to get you to join the world. If that doesn't work, they'll try to get you to hide in the house of God so you have no influence on the world. And Jesus said, I don't want you to love the world. The love of the fa- if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. We're not supposed to love the world, neither the things that are in the world. But he also said, go ye out into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So we're not supposed to join the world. We're not supposed to meet with them. We're not supposed to leave the work of God to fellowship with them. But you have to go out and be among them. You have to go out and have contact with them. The Bible says in Hebrews that Jesus was separate from sinners, yet he ate with them and he fellowshiped with them and he was around them all the time. So the Bible wants us to be in the world, but not of the world. We're not supposed to, we're not monks hiding away in a monastery somewhere. We're not supposed to be cut off from the world. We're supposed to be able to go talk to them, go preach to them, but not have them get on us, not have them influence influence us, but have us win them to Christ. And it seems like many of our churches, it's one or the other. It's people so worldly that you can, the only way you know they're a Christian is because they say they are, or they're so far separated from the world, so, so much hiding in the church that you wonder if they have any contact with the world. And uh, you, gotta, you can't do either one. You got to leave. We, we come to church here so we can be built up, we can edify, be strengthened, so we can go out into this world and tell others about Christ. And, and the world, the devil, and the flesh, they're going to try to get you to one extreme or another. I just hide in the church. The only people I ever talk to are Christians. The only people I ever have any communication with are saved people. Well, then you're, not, you're sinning. You're not wrong because the Lord told you to go preach the gospel to the lost. But if you take that all the way to, well, I'm going to just join them. I'm going to leave the work. I'm going to leave the church. I'm going to go all out with them. Then you're sinning and you're not right either. So we're in church we are fellowshipping with the people of God so that we can go out into the world. Look at, hold your finger here, go to John 17. John 17. Now, in John 17, you have the Lord's Prayer. Now, it's not what people call the Lord's Prayer, but this is actually where the Lord prayed. Jesus is about to go to the cross. He's about to leave this world to rejoin his father. And he's praying for his disciples, interceding on their behalf. John 17, look at verse number 14. He says, I have given them thy word. That's that's what's important. I have given them thy word and the world hath hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Jesus Christ, about to go to the cross, he's praying for his disciples. In verse 15, he says, I'm not praying that you would take them out of the world, but that you would keep them from the evil. In other words, you're not supposed to leave the world in the sense of you have no contact with them, but you're supposed to be in them. You're supposed to be around them, among them, but they are not supposed to rub off on you. The Lord says, I am praying that you would be kept from the evil. Now, when we get, we get, when the Lord comes 
for us, whether he comes for us in the rapture or we leave here by death, that's when we get to escape the presence of being around sin completely. The, the presence, uh, we get to escape never being around sinners and all that. That'll be a great, wonderful time. But right now, we're supposed to be in the world, not of the world. And Jesus is praying, I'm not praying, Father, that you would take them out of the world, but that you would keep them from the evil. And that's a good prayer for yourself and for your brothers and sisters in Christ, that the, the evil of this world would not rub off on them. You're not supposed to leave the world so that you have no contact with them. How are they ever going to hear without a preacher, right? So you need to be in the world, but not of the world. Go back to Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 6. There's a great song. There's a great song. Uh, maybe someone will sing it one of these days in here. It says, um, th there's a line in there that says, talking about the Lord, his house. It says, my house is full, but my fields are empty. Everyone wants to sit around my table, but no one wants to work in my field. And um, it's, it's the idea of everyone likes church, everyone likes fellowship, but how about going out into the work, working in my field? And uh, it's a great song. But look at, um, look at chapter 6, verse number 10. It says, Afterward I came unto the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, the son of Mehetabiel, who was shut up. Shut up. This man, Shemaiah, is shut up. There's a work going on for God, and he's not involved in it. There's a wall being built, and he's hiding. He's not. He's shut up. He's not involved in it. And he asked Nehemiah, why don't you stop working on the wall, and why don't you come do nothing with me? And uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's going to be the temptation that's going to constantly come at you. Why don't you stop working for God? Why don't you stop being so fanatical and come do nothing with us because we like it? And uh, you, you got to say, nope, I got work to do. I, I, I'm not hiding in the temple when there's work to do. Look, whatever you do in this life, whether it's for God or whether it's for man, whatever you do, there's going to be an element of risk to it. There's going to be an element of danger to it. Uh, you can't get away from that. But it's worth it to serve God. Serving God is more important than preserving your life. And he says, well, they're going to kill you. They're going to slay you. Hide together with me. Nehemiah says, not have it. Not have it. There's a work to be done. He says, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple and let us shut the doors of the temple for they will come to slay thee. Yea, in the night will they come to slay thee. Hold your finger here. Go to Proverbs 22. Proverbs 22. He said, uh, Nehemiah, it's too dangerous. What you're trying to do, too many risks, too many hazards, too many, danger, too many dangers. Just, just come in the house of God, lock the door, shut the doors, come in here and hide with me. Proverbs 22, verse number 13 says, The slothful man saith, there is a virus without. Oh, no, no, that's not what it says. Uh, there is a lion without. I shall be slain in the streets. So you know, what the, you know what the lazy man says? You know what the slothful man says? There's danger out there. I better not go out and do anything. I better not go out and work. I better just stay inside here and hide. And uh, a lot of times that's just a justification to, do, to not do what you didn't want to do already. Well, I can't go outside. There's a lion out there. Well, no, the real reason is just because you're lazy and you don't want to go outside. And people have all these excuses of why they won't work for God when you boil it down and you just don't want to work. <laughs> you just don't want to do it. And you can, put, you can put all kinds of excuses and justifications on it, but you just don't want to get out there and do the work. But go back to, go back to me with uh, Nehemiah, Nehemiah 6. He says in verse 10, Let us meet together in the house of God within the temple, and let us shut the doors of the temple, for they will come to slay thee. Yea, in the night will they come to slay thee. And I said, Should such a man as I flee... And who is there that being as I am would go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. You know what Nehemiah said? I don't know who you think you're talking to. I'm not going to do that. I am not going to run and hide while everybody else is working on this wall. It's a selfish temptation because they can't all, all the Jews that are working on the wall, they can't all hide in the temple. They can't all shut the doors and be safe. So the temptation is, Nehemiah, why don't you save yourself? Forget all those people that are working on the wall. Come save yourself. Forget about your co-laborers. Forget about your fellow laborers, everybody helping you. You just take care of you. You just make sure you're safe. It's a selfish temptation. And uh, if you're going to be in leadership, 
you're going to have to take risks that you didn't want to take because it's not just about you. It's about everybody that you're supposed to be leading, you're supposed to be serving. And uh, there's going to be times where you could avoid the danger, but you can't because uh, there, people are looking to you. And you got, you got to stand. You got to stand. And you said, Nehemiah said, you know who I am, right? You know I'm the governor, right? You know I'm sent by Artaxerxes, right? Do you, do you know who I am, right? You think I'm going to come do nothing with you? You think I'm going to save myself? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I, I'm going to show you a, a, great, a great truth here. Hold your finger here. Go to Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15. Folks, serving God is more important than preserving your life. Now, if you can do both, that's the goal. That's my goal. What about you? I want to preserve my life and serve God. But um, if it's a choice, you serve God. And we don't, well, look at Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15, verse number 1. And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. So there's some people troubling the church of Antioch saying, salvation is not just by grace through faith. You also need to keep the law of Moses. You also need to be circumcised. And there was a great argument, no small dissension. They go up to Jerusalem to settle this matter once and for all. Now, if you read the chapter, the matter is, the matter is settled. Salvation is by grace through faith. We're not under the law. And now they're going to bring word back to the church in Antioch to, to, make, to give them the conclusion of the matter. Look, verse uh, 22, Acts 15, 22. Then pleased it the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, surnamed Barsabbas, and Silas, chief men among the brethren. And they wrote letters by them after this manner, the apostles and elders and brethren send greeting unto the brethren which are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia, for as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying, Ye must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. It seemed good unto us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul. Look at verse 26. Men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. When the church in Jerusalem wanted to send men to straighten out a doctrinal argument, a doctrinal disagreement, you know who they sent? Men that hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know why? Because if it's not important enough to you to hazard your life for it, then we really don't care what you have to say. Look, at this time, Christians are getting killed for their faith. They're being martyred. If what you have to say is not important enough to put your life on, on the line for it, then sit down, let somebody else talk. We don't need to hear from you. If it's not that important to you, why should it be that important to anybody else? And so to send out, to settle a doctrinal argument, a doctrinal disagreement, they sent men that hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And folks, if what you have to say, look, if what a preacher has to say from, from the pulpit, if he's not willing to take it to the streets and suffer rebuke for it, then who cares what he has to say? Because it doesn't mean enough to him to suffer any rebuke for it, to suffer any opposition for it. And Nehemiah said, I'm not going into that temple. I'm not hiding. I'm not, I'm not going to save my life. What I came here to do is more important than my life. And if, if what you have to say is not important enough to hazard your life for it, then sit down, let somebody else who actually cares say something, because it's not important to you. Why should it be important, important to anybody else? And it's a great truth. It's a great truth. You know, just because somebody has suffered for Christ, just because someone who has hazarded their life for the name of Christ, it doesn't make them automatically right in everything that they say. But it does say a lot about them. It does say that they really believe what they're saying and they're committed to it and devoted enough to it to risk their life. Now, it doesn't, it doesn't make them a, a 
doctrinal genius. It doesn't make them right in everything they have to say. You don't take it at, well, that, that person, look at what they went through. Well, they must be right. No, you can't take it that far. But if you're not willing to do that, if you're not willing to suffer for, for it, then we really don't care what you have to say because obviously it doesn't mean that much to you. And, and Nehemiah said, look, you think, I'm, you think I came all the way from Shushan to hide in the, in the temple? You think I came all the way, I left the palace? You think I did all that just to hide with you and do nothing? Not doing it. Not doing it. This is more important than my life. This is more important than the opposition I'm getting. This is the work of God we're talking about. Go, go back to Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 6. Nehemiah chapter 6 says in verse number 12, And lo, I perceived that God had not sent him, but that he pronounced this prophecy against me, for Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. He was hired to say this. He did it for money. And notice that Nehemiah, he didn't perceive that he wasn't sent from God until after he took his stand. In other words, he said, I'm not doing that. I'm not hiding. I'm not going into that temple. And then, and then God reveals the truth of the matter to him. Then he perceives what's really going on and who this guy is really about. And a lot of Christians, they walk through their life and you wonder, how can they not perceive that? How do they not know that guy's a phony? How do they not go that how do they not know that guy's a fraud? How do they not know he's a hireling? How do they not know how do they not know they're being lied to? And the answer is somewhere along the way, God told them to take a stand for righteousness and they didn't stand. They didn't take the stand that God told them to take. And Nehemiah, he takes the stand. He says, I'm not doing, I'm not going into the temple. And then, then and only then he perceives the real truth of the matter. And he says, lo, I perceive that God did not send him, but that he pronounced this prophecy against me for Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. So here's a hired prophet. He's a hired preach, a hired preacher. He's going to say whatever the people that are paying him want to say. And that's how you got that's who you got to work out, watch out for in the New Testament. You got to watch out for people who are going to tell you whatever you want to hear because that's what brings the offerings in. He's a hireling preacher. Hold your finger here, go to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. When you, when you um, visit a, the vast majority of the churches in this country, if you spend any, any time there, you realize there's so, many, there's so many things of the Bible they never seem to touch. How can you go to a church year after year after year and you never, you never hear this preached about or that preached about? It's like, how, did, how does every sermon they pick it never, it never lands on that topic. It never lands, lands on that verse. How is that possible? Well, the answer is because those things don't bring in the offerings. Don't, those, those things don't pray, uh, pay. They don't give you a nice career with jobs and benefits. And so preachers don't preach them. Uh, John 10, look at verse number 10. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. You got to watch out. Lord warned you many, many times. Watch out for people who are only in it for the money. Watch out for people who are being paid to preach, paid to tell you, this is, that's okay. That sin's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. God's okay with that. Why are they telling you that? Because that's what, that's, that's who the people are paying. That's what they're paying to get. You know, people go to a, uh, a show. They pay to see what they want to see. They go to some kind of sporting event. They're paying to get what they want to hear. People come to church. They want to hear a certain kind of message. They want to hear a certain kind of thing. That's what they're paying to get. So the person in the pulpit, that's what he gives them. Because that's what the people are there. That's what they paid to get. And if you're going to represent God, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You don't have to be a preacher. You're going to represent God to this world. 
You don't, you don't tell them what you think they want to hear. You don't tell them what you think is, that they think is popular or socially acceptable. You tell them what God told them to tell you. Thus saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. And here, here's Shemaiah. He's a, hired, he's a hired false prophet. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 6 that the love of money is the root of all evil. So you find evil wherever it is. If you were to, if you were to follow that far enough, if you really wanted to dig into all that garbage, which I wouldn't recommend, if you were to dig far enough, get, get beyond another level down, another level down, at the heart of it, the heart of it, you're going to find the love of money somewhere. The love of money is the root of all evil. Well, he's hired. He's hired. Now, this is convicting to me because the enemy is all in. The enemy is willing to spend money to stop the work of God. Tobiah and Sanballat hired him. Now, you can criticize them for hiring a false prophet, and rightfully so, but they're all in to their agenda. They're all in to their cause. They are spending their hard-earned money. Well, maybe it's, maybe it's hard-earned, maybe it's not, but they are spending their money to hire a false prophet to stop the work of God. Now, the question for you, the question for me is, are we willing to spend our, men, our money to help the work of God? The enemy is all in. The enemy is willing to shell out money to hinder the work of God. They don't care how much it costs. They don't care what, whatever they have to do. They're going to do it to make sure this wall is stopped. Now, I wonder, are we that dedicated? Are we going to do whatever it takes to make sure the work of God is finished, that is completed, that is done the way God wanted it to do? In many cases, sadly, many cases, uh, this world, we're, we're, the Christians in this world, in this country, were simply outworked. We're outhearted, we're outworked. What they, they, the world cares more about their cause than we do about ours. And um, I, I, don't think, I don't think, to my knowledge, I don't think we've, America has ever had as many sign-holding street preachers in this country. I don't think we've ever had as much as we do right now. Now, they're not preaching the gospel. They're preaching abortion or they're preaching uh, pro-choice or whatever the case is. But the, this, war, this country, like never before, is taking to the streets, holding signs, lifting up their voices, making their cause known because they are passionate about it. And Christians are sitting in their homes watching it saying, wow, things are so bad. Wow, look at all that. Hey, they're doing what you're supposed to be doing. They are taking their cause out to the street passionately because of what they believe in, trying to make a difference. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And uh, if you can't go through your life just watching the enemy work. You got to do something for God yourself. The enemy is not going to sit back and watch you work. You can't sit back and watch the enemy work. Otherwise, nothing gets done for God. Nothing gets done for God. And that's where we are in this country. The enemy is more devoted to their cause than we are to ours. That's the reality of the situation. You, if you want to get anything done for God, you're going to have to at least be as dedicated to the work of God as the enemy is dedicated to stopping the work of God. And that's, that's, just, that's just the fact of the matter. Uh, look at um, verse number 14, or 13. Verse 13. Therefore was he hired that I should be afraid and do so and sin, that they might have matter for an evil report, that they might reproach me. So they wanted Nehemiah to come into the temple. So as soon as he did, they could turn around and accuse him. And that's, that's, that's exactly how this world operates. And that's exactly how the devil operates. You know, you know what this world does? You know what they say to you? Oh, come drink with me. Come have some drinks. Come to this party. It's no big deal. You can be a Christian and drink. I know a lot of Christians that do it. Why don't you come do this? And you know, you know, the moment you do it, the very next day, they're going to be turning around you, turning around, calling you a hypocrite, a fake, and they're going to be accusing you for doing the very thing that they told you they wanted you to do. And that, that's how this world operates. You can't trust them. You can't trust them. And that's, that's the devil, too. The devil is called the tempter, and he's also called the accuser of the brethren. So the devil comes and tempts you. He tells you it's no big deal. He tells you the sin isn't a big deal. Everybody does it. It'll be fun. No big deal. And as soon as you do it, he's up at the throne of God accusing you before the Lord saying, look what he did. Can you, did you see what he did? Did you see, see the sin he just committed? 
See, he's going to you and he's telling you it's not a big deal. And as soon as you do it, he's going to the Lord and telling him it is a big deal. And that's how the devil works and how, that's how the world works. They will try to get you in every way possible to compromise, to sin. And as soon as you, as soon as they, as soon as you do, the respect's gone and they're mocking you and they're calling you a hypocrite. And they're, you're, you're their next example for why they won't get saved because all the Christians they know are hypocrites. Why? Because you gave in to what they wanted you to do. And that's what's going on here. Hey, Nehemiah, why don't you come into the temple? Why don't you be safe? Why don't you hide yourself? And if he had done it, if he had done it, the very next day, the news would have been out. You know what Nehemiah did? You know, he's hiding in the temple. You know, he's not supposed to do that, right? The very, the very thing they said wasn't a big deal. They would have been accusing him of doing it had he done it. And so this world's not your friend. They want to act like they're your friend, but you give in to what they want, and they're going to only use it against you. And uh, turn with me to get two passages. Get Numbers chapter 1. Numbers chapter 1 and Second Chronicles 23. Numbers chapter 1 and Second Chronicles 23. It wasn't just that there was a work going on for God. That, that was definitely a big part of it, but it's more to it. There's more to it than that. Numbers 21 and 2 Chronicles 23. Numbers chapter 1, verse number 50. But thou shalt appoint the Levites over the tabernacle of testimony, and over all the vessels thereof, and over all things that belong to it, they shall bear the tabernacle and all the vessels thereof, and they shall minister unto it, and shall encamp round about the tabernacle. And when the tabernacle setteth forward, the Levites shall take it down, and, the ta and when the tabernacle is to be pitched, the Levites shall set it up, and the stranger that cometh nigh shall be put to death. And the children of Israel shall pitch their tents, every man by his own camp, and every man by his own standard throughout their hosts. But the Levites shall pitch round about the tabernacle of testimony, that there be no wrath upon the congregation of the children of Israel. And the Levites shall keep the charge of the tabernacle of testimony. So, if anyone but a Levite came into the temple, into the tabernacle, there'd be wrath from the Lord. And the punishment was death. So it's not just that there's a work going on. It's They're trying to get him to violate the law of Moses. Nehemiah is not a Levite. Nehemiah is from Judah. He has no business going into the temple. Look at 2 Chronicles 23. 2 Chronicles 23, verse number 1. And in the seventh year, Jehoiada strengthened himself and took the captains of hundreds, Azariah the son of Jehoram, and Ishmael the son of Jehoanan, and Azariah the son of Obed, and Messiah the son of Adiah, and Elishaphat the son of Zikri, in a covenant with him. And they went about in Judah and gathered the Levites out of all the cities of Judah and the chief of the fathers, fathers of Israel, and they came to Jerusalem. And all the congregation made a covenant with the king in the house of God. And he said unto them, Behold, the king's son shall reign, as the Lord hath said of the sons of David. This is the thing that ye shall do. A third part of you entering on the Sabbath of the priests and of the Levites shall be porters of the doors. And a third part shall be at the king's house, and a third part at the gate of the foundation, and all the people shall be in the courts of the house of the Lord. But let none come into the house of the Lord, save the priests, and they that minister of the Levites. They shall go in, for they are holy, but all the people shall keep the watch of the Lord. If you're not a priest, or if you're not a Levite who has specific business being there, then you're not supposed to be there. You're not supposed to be in the temple. And Sanballat and Tobiah and Shemaiah, they knew that. You know, this world knows a lot more than you think they do when it comes to certain things. And a lot of times they have a better idea of what a Christian is supposed to be than the people who call themselves Christians. They know that a Christian is supposed to live holy. The Christians don't seem to know it, but the lost people know it. They know that if you claim the name of Christ, there are certain things you're not supposed to do. There are certain places you're not supposed to go. You're, there's a certain way you're supposed to live. And sadly, it's the Christians saying, oh, no, there's nothing wrong with that. I can do that. I can trust Jesus and do that. A lot of times the, the world has a more accurate picture of how Christians are supposed to live than the Christians do. And they know, they know that if Nehemiah went into the temple, they, they know, they know it would be a sin. 
And they're trying to get him to do it. And uh, go back with me to Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 6. Look at verse number 14. How does Nehemiah respond to this? He says, My God, my God, think thou upon Tobiah and Sanballat, according to these their works, and on the prophetess Noadiah, and the rest of the prophets that would have put me in fear. So there's a lot of other people involved in this plot, in this conspiracy. It's Tobiah and Sanballat, and Noadiah, and there's apparently other prophets too. But what does he do? He just takes it to God. And that's what we've seen over and over in this book. Nehemiah is faced with opposition. He doesn't try to face the opposition himself. He takes it to God. Look at, I'll show you this. Go back to chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse number 3. It says, Now Tobiah the Ammonite was by him, and he said, Even that which they build, if a fox go up, he shall even break down their stone wall. Verse 4, Hear, O our God, for we are despised and turn their reproach upon their own head. Look at verse number 8. And conspired all of them together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. Nevertheless, we made our prayer unto our God and set a watch against them day and night because of them. He just takes it to God. Look at chapter 5, verse number 19. After all, after all the opposition from within, from the, the, the usury being exacted of the Jews, like we saw last week, chapter 5, verse number 19, think upon me, my God, for good, according to all that I have done for this people. He just takes it to God and asks for God's help. Look at chapter 6, verse number 9, or yeah, verse number 9. For they all made us afraid, saying, Their hands shall be weakened from the work, that it be not done. Now therefore, O God, strengthen my hands. And verse 14, my God, think thou upon Tobiah, Tobiah and Sanballat, according to these their works. And every one of these case, cases, when Nehemiah is faced with opposition by the enemy, he simply takes it to God for help. And that's, that's the lesson you need. That's the lesson I need. That's the lesson we all need. Because when someone opposes us, we want to react in the flesh. At least I do. I'll just speak for myself. I want to react in the flesh. Maybe you don't. But I want to react in the flesh. But that's not the way the Lord told us to do it. Just take it to God, leave the matter with him, and let him defend you. And he can do a lot better job than you can. He is a better shield. He is a better defense that you are, than you are and that I am. Just take it to God. That's what Nehemiah does. Uh, hold your finger here. Go, here. go to Isaiah chapter 8. I'm going to show you this verse. It's a great verse. We're de he's dealing with this hireling preacher. He's dealing, dealing with this hireling preacher who has sent to tell him something that would contradict the word of God. Now, how would you know when a preacher is lying to you? How would you know when somebody who's claiming to represent God isn't telling you the truth? <laughs> like I've said time and time again, you got to know this book, folks. Look, there is no shortcut in the Christian life. You got to know this book. You got to love it. You got to meditate on it. You got to read it. You got to study it. It's got to be your life. It's got to be real to you. Isaiah 8. Isaiah 8, verse number 20. Great verse. You ought to, keep, ought to commit it to memory. Isaiah 8, 20. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. If what somebody is saying is not in accord with this book, the Bible says it is because there is no light, no light in them. You are not obligated to believe anyone who is telling, something, some, telling you something that is not in accord with the law of God, with the word of God. That's how you know it. That's the only way you can know. If they speak not according to this word, it's because there's no light in them. Back to Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 6, verse number 15. Nehemiah 6, 15. So the wall was finished, praise the Lord. The wall was finished in the 20 and 5th day of the month Elul. That would be the 6th month. Month Elul in 50 and 2 days. 50 and 2 days. Now I don't know about you, but that encourages me. Because so far in this book... Chapter after chapter after chapter is opposition, fighting, opposition, fighting, trying to hinder the work. 
And for all their efforts, guess what? The wall got done. The wall was completed. You know what that tells me? That tells me greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And the enemy can fight and fight and fight, but if you yield to the Holy Spirit and submit to the word of God, they can't stop you. They cannot st- the enemy cannot stop you from growing if you want to grow. The enemy cannot wreck your Christian life if you want to serve God. Now, they can cause a lot of damage, but they cannot damage your relationship to God. They cannot stop you from accomplishing something from God if that's what you're determined to do. And Nehemiah was determined to do this for God, and it got done. Opposition from without, opposition from within. Paul said, fighting is without, fears within. Right? And guess what? The work got done. The job got done. The wall's finished. 52 days. Pretty good. 52 days. Look at verse number 16. And it came to pass that when all our enemies heard thereof, and all the heathen that were about us saw these things, they were much cast down in their own eyes, for they perceived that this work was wrought of our God. Isn't that just like the world? It just ruins this world, the lost people in this world. It just ruins their day when anybody does something for God. It just ruins their day. You, you, we, we were going by... Uh, we were several of us. We were out at the um, the parade in uh, Norwich, yeah, the Memorial Day parade in Norwich, just a month or so ago, and uh, walked by this man, offered him a track, you know, a piece of paper, you know, a piece of paper, offered him a piece of paper as I was walking, walking on my way, and he told me that me being there and doing that ruined his entire day. I said, really? Me offering you a piece of paper ruined your day. At that point, I think he realized how foolish it was, but you can't turn back from that. So, yes. Yes, it ruined my day. I said, wow, that's amazing. It's pretty amazing. But, um, you know, it, it really does. You take a stand for the Lord on your job on the street corner, and people just lose their minds. They just... For no reason. Look, their income isn't hurt. Their family isn't damaged. They're not injured. Nothing is hurting them in any way by you standing up for the Lord. And yet it just ruins their day. It just, it just drives them insane because they're just that much set against God. Uh, that's the world. And, and they, they're, they're much cast down in their own eyes. But notice, notice, they perceive that this work would rot of our God. So when you do something for the Lord, you actually accomplish something for the Lord, they can mock all they want. They can say there's nothing to it and all they want. But on some level, they know, you know what? God had to help him because that's not just, that's just not something men do by themselves. The Lord's helping that person. And they'll know. They'll know. They perceive that this work was wrought of our God. Look at verse number 17. Moreover, in those days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters unto Tobiah, and the letters of Tobiah came unto them. For there were many in Judah sworn unto him, because he was the son-in-law of Shechaniah, the son of Era, and his son Johanan had taken the daughter of Meshulam, the son of Berechiah. Also, they reported his good deeds before me and uttered my words to him. And Tobiah sent letters to put me in fear. Okay, first of all, these letters. They're sending letters back and forth. Tobiah is sending letters back and forth to these nobles of Judah because they're, they're connected. They have family relations there. And um, here's, here's, the, here's the encouragement and the challenge to me that I find. I, I, I find a lot of encouragement, believe it or not, in ch- verses 17 and 19. Because these heathen, these enemies of God, in verse 16, they are much cast down in their own eyes. They are discouraged. They are disappointed that they could not stop the work from being done. And guess what? But they haven't given up. And they're still trying to influence Nehemiah. They're still trying to bring him down. They're doing what they can. Look, they've already failed. The wall's finished. The wall's completed. And yet they're, they're not giving up. They're still sending letters. They're still doing what they can to try to disrupt something. And that's, that's encouraging to me. That's encouraging to me because every one of us, to some degree or another, we've been discouraged or are discouraged about our lack of ability to do something or lack of ability to accomplish something. And 
There's a lesson we can learn here from the enemies of God. They failed in what they tried to do, and yet they haven't given up on their cause, and they're still trying to do whatever little bit they can do to try to hinder the work of God. That's encouraging to me, and I hope it's encouraging to you that maybe you have failed to do some things. Maybe you have failed to accomplish some things for God that you would have wanted to do that you would have wanted to do or that you would have wanted to accomplish. But guess what? There's still something you can do. And don't give up. Don't be discouraged. Take it from these enemies. They have failed to stop the wall from being completed, and yet they're doing whatever they can. Whatever they can. Whatever little bit they can, however seemingly insignificant it might be, just sending letters after the wall's already finished. Very insignificant. What could that do? But they're trying. They're doing what they can. What a lesson to us. What a lesson to us to just do what we can. Jesus commended that woman back in the Gospels because she did what she could. She had done what she could. Now, that's, that's what we need to do. We need to do what we can. I need to do what I can. You need to do what you can. Only the Lord knows what that will come to, but we can all do what we can do, every one of us. Now, verse number 18 says, For there were many in Judah sworn unto him, because he was the son-in-law of Shechaniah, the son of Era, and his son Johanan had taken the daughter of Meshulam, the son of Berechiah. So, back, go back to, go back to chapter 3. There's, uh, there's family connections here. Tobiah and his son has married into uh, these, uh, these nobles of Judah. And so it's not so simple as us and them. It's, well, yeah, he's, we've known him a long time. He's part of the family, and he's actually a pretty decent guy. He's really not all that bad, and blah, blah, blah. Look at chapter 3, chapter 3, verse number 4. And next unto them repaired Merimoth, the son of Uriah, the son of Kaz. And next unto them repaired Meshulam, the son of Berechiah, the son of, the son of Meshezebel. The daughter, uh, that's the same guy, uh, the daughter of Meshulam, the son of uh, Mer- Berechiah. That's what, that's what you have in, ver- in chapter 6, verse 18, and chapter 3, verse 4. There he is right there working on the wall. Look at chapter, verse, uh, chapter 3, verse number 30. After him repaired Hananiah, the son of Shelemiah, and Hanan, the sixth son of Zalaf, another piece. After him repaired Meshulam, the son of Berechiah, over against his chamber. So here's a man that's uh, working on the wall. And um, here's, a, here's a necessary truth. It's, it's a sad truth, but it's a necessary truth. Not everyone that's working on the wall is completely dedicated to the wall. Some people are doing it because that's the thing to do. That's what everyone else around them is doing. So they're kind of just carried off a little bit into the work. Well, because that's the people they're around. Well, everybody, everybody around me that I can see right now is working on this wall. I guess I'll join in and work on this wall. But they're not sold out. They're not dedicated. They're just doing it because everybody around them is doing it. And uh, whatever you're doing for God, praise the Lord, I'm glad for it. But you need to make sure you're doing it for God. You're not just doing it because, well, my family's doing it, my friends are doing it, the people I'm around at the current moment are doing it. Here's a man, he's working on the wall, praise the Lord for it. It's a help, it's a blessing, but he's doing it because, well, that's the thing to do at the moment. But there's, there's further, there's other dedications and devotions that are more important to him than actually working for God and working on the wall. And not everybody that works on the wall, not everybody sets out for God, is, has it in their mind, I'm going to do this no matter what. But you need to get there. If you are there, praise the Lord. If you're not there, you need to work towards it. You need to get to the place where you're not just doing something for God, but there's nothing that could hinder that from happening. There's nothing that would take you away from working on, the, working on, on that wall or whatever you're doing for God. And nothing else is more important. And... Uh, Here's, here's a man, he's, here's Tobiah and his son and their family. They've married into these uh, Jewish families. They've married their daughters. And, and now it's not so simple as, well, we're the people of God and they're the enemies. Now it's kind of all mixed together and lost. And yeah, I know he's, I know he's been trying to hinder the work of God. I know he's been trying to destroy you, Nehemiah. But, you know, you, you should really understand that you know, you're a newcomer in Jerusalem, and we've had these connections for a long, long time, and you really can't expect us to give them up. You really can't expect us to, to say, hey, you shouldn't be doing that. And Nehemiah said, I thought we were supposed to do it. I thought we were supposed to be doing something for God. I thought that was the main thing. I thought we were trying, I thought we were here because we love the Lord and we're trying to do something for Him. 
Well, maybe he thought that, but he wasn't aware of all the family connections that, were, that was there. He wasn't aware of everything, that all the prior social relationships that were going on. And here's people, they're working for Nehemiah, they're working on the wall, but their real devotion lies somewhere else. And um, the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, that in the last days perilous times shall come. And one of those descriptions, it says men, men shall be lovers of themselves, uh, having a form of godliness, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. One of those things that it mentions there in verse number four, it says traitors, heady, high-minded, and traitors. And folks, a traitor is, supposed to, is, is someone who's supposed to be on your side, but his true allegiance is to the other side. And you need, to, you need to get in your mind, well, what side am I on? Am I serving the Lord? Am I trying to accomplish something for the Lord? Or am I paying attention? Am I fellowshipping with people who are trying to destroy the work of the Lord? And you're going to you're gonna have to decide that for yourself. But family relations, it's a, it's, a, it's a tough thing. It's a tough thing. But Jesus said, if you love anything, anyone more than me, your father, your mother, your brother, your sister, your wife, your own life, you love anyone more than me, he said, you're not worthy of me. And so, yeah, maintain your family relationships if you can. Maintain your friendships if you can. But if it's a choice between following them and doing something for the Lord Jesus Christ, you better make sure you make the right choice. You better make sure there's no doubt that you're on the right side and you're going to do something for God. A lot of people have been thrown off for that. Look at verse number 19. They said, also they reported his good deeds before me and uttered my words to him. Oh, he's a, he's a good guy. Look at all the good things he's done. Look at, look at all the good things he's done in his life. Look at all the money he gives to charity. Look at all, he's, he's actually a really good guy. Yeah, but he's been, destro- he's been trying to destroy this work from the very beginning. Yeah, but he, well, he, yeah, we've known him for a long time. And yeah, yeah I mean, he, he does a lot of good things. Yeah, but he's destroying the work of God. And that's how it goes. That's how it goes. He's really a good guy. Yeah, I know he's trying to, he's trying to hinder what God's doing. But I mean, he's, he's really a good guy. Also, they reported his good deeds before me and uttered my words to him. And Tobiah sent letters to put me in fear. Now, fear... Fear is going to cripple your walk for the Lord if, if you fear man more than God. Fear will take you out of the race. I'll give you a couple verses on that. Actually, before you do, go, to, go, to, go with me to Proverbs 28. Proverbs 28. We are supposed to be loyal to people but that's after the word of God. You're, you, you, you're loyal to the word of God first and foremost. And then as much as you're able to, as much as life in you, then you're loyal to people also. But they're not more important than the word of God. Proverbs 28, Proverbs 28, verse number four. They that forsake the law praise the wicked, but such as keep the law contend with them. And that's what's going on in Nehemiah. They forsaken the law of God. They don't care what the Bible says. They're praising Tobiah. That's what's going on. Now, look at, um, go to 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Second Timothy chapter 1, verse number 7. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So that fear didn't come from God. We're supposed to fear God. We're not supposed to fear, fear flesh and blood. We're not supposed to fear man. The fear of man bringeth a snare. We don't fear man, we fear God. And what are they trying to do? The wall is already done. They can't stop it from being completed. It's already completed. But now that it's done, what are, they going, what are they trying to do? They're trying to put Nehemiah in fear. Trying to put him in fear. Go back to Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 4. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse number 14. And I looked and rose up and said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, Be not ye afraid of them. Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible. Look at chapter 6, verse number 9. For they all made us... Afraid, 
They all made us afraid, saying, Their hands shall be weakened from the work. Chapter 6, verse number 13. Therefore was he hired that I should be afraid and do so. Chapter, uh, look at verse number 14. Next verse, 14. My God, think thou upon Tobiah and Sanballat, according to these their works, and on the prophetess Noadiah and the rest of the prophets, that would have put me in fear. Verse number 19, end of the verse. And Tobiah sent letters to put me in fear. So, you're going to have... You're going to have some choices to make in your life. Every one of us does from time to time. You're going to have to decide, who do I fear more? Do I fear God or do I fear man? And whichever one you fear more, that's the one you're going to obey. You fear man more, you're going to do what man says. You fear God more, you're going to do what God says. That's the bottom line. You need to fear God. What does? Because if we feared God like we ought to, well, then everybody else's opinion is out the window. What does God want me to do? And that's how we, that's how we ought to live our lives. What does the Bible say? What does the Lord want me to do?